Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, clinical problem solvers. It's Tuesday, it's neurology morning report. So nice to see everyone. And you know the routine if you've been here before. If you don't, you're about to know the routine and that's that we would love to have someone present a case if you have one, neurology case. Um, and we would love to have two discussions to discuss the case, ideally one identifying as a woman and one identifying as a man. If you haven't done this before, it's fun, it's casual, it's laid back. We just hear about the case and we try to figure it out together and see as we go what we got um, on the right track and not so much on the right track and what we can learn from that process. So who does anyone, did anyone bring a neurology case for us? That is a deafening silence. Okay, Maria and Raphael, if you could help us out there with a case from, from the ether somewhere. Um, and who would like to discuss a case today? So a deafening silence here. You might be thinking, oh, it's my first neurology morning report. Let me just see how it goes first. Well, you could see how it goes by participating. That would be, that would be fun. I feel like I'm on, those of you who listen to NPR on your commutes or whatever, and they're doing a fun facing drive and it's always like, get back to the program. And just like, maybe you're in your car right now enjoying NPR and you're thinking I'm in traffic. I should call and contribute to NPR. These, uh, I always feel like I'm doing that. Um, trying to uh, sell this to you. Maybe you're thinking, <laughs> English is not my first language and I, I, I'm not sure. Um, well, we have Spanish speakers and Portuguese speakers and French speakers and so many speakers of so many languages. So if you're not sure how to say something, I wanna say it in your native language and we will um, translate it for you. That's totally fine. All right, talking isn't working, silence isn't working. Maria, Rafa, do you want to encourage some people to do this? You're veteran participators. Well, I love neurology, so I'm a bit biased, but I started not loving neurology. I was really scared. Um, you know, neurophobia gets to everyone, so, and NeuroVMR really helped, and if you please volunteer. We'll find you a case, we promise. Um, yay, Gabriel, it worked. Gabriel, <laughs> fantastic, who last participated on his birthday. That's how much he loves NeuroVMR. Um, so that's fantastic. Who would like to discuss this case with, um, with Gabriel and myself? Ideally, uh, someone identifying as a woman. Anyone? And still out there since I know a bunch of people joined, if anyone brought a case that they would like to present today. I see a CP Solvers team member attending in the background who probably has cases. No, not looking at anyone in particular. <laughs> um, and who would like to discuss with Gabrielle? Please, someone. If you've never done this before and you've been waiting, it could be great. If you've done this before. Maria or Rafa, do you have a case for us? Not yet, okay. Yeah, we're oh. looking for that, don't worry. You're, li you're looking for it. Okay, um, why don't you, um, Gabrielle, introduce yourself and inspire um, someone to to join you today in the in the driver's seat. Gabrielle, are you still there? Do you want to introduce yourself and hopefully someone will be inspired to to join you? Oh no, did we lose our only discussant? He went to get his charger, but I think he's coming oh. back. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, 
Um, okay, we have a case from Maria. That's fantastic. Anyone like to discuss with Gabrielle? Ravi, okay. We have two folks who I think have discussed before. So last chance for anyone who has not discussed before was hoping to discuss today. I saw someone unmuting. I don't know if that was just Zoom doing things or you were trying to volunteer. Not sure. Okay. Um, there you go. Maria has a case. Gabrielle and Ravi uh, have volunteered and hopefully you will inspire others to want to volunteer next Tuesday because um, now we only have 50 minutes left to discuss the case and it will be, as you know, very hard for me to finish by 10 a.m. with the neurology case. Okay, go ahead and introduce yourselves, my friends, and we'll get started. Yes, I'm Ravi. I'm calling from India. I'm a 30 year medical student. Fantastic. Welcome, Ravi. Glad to have you. Hi, everyone. My name is Gabriel. I'm very excited to be here. I still have a little neurophobia, but very happy to have this opportunity to learn with you guys. Uh, sorry if you called me earlier. I was trying to find my charger of my computer. It, it was about to shut, shut down. <laughs> no problem. Great. And Maria, I think everyone is part of your fan club already here, but feel free to introduce yourself and then take us into the chief concern. And Rafa, thanks for scribing and teaching points and, and uh, the rest. Oh, wait a second. Rafa, can you share your screen? Because I'm going to be reading the case. <laughs> oh. Okay, no problem. Yeah, just, it, it'll, be, <laughs> it'll be harder, right? Like to read the case and we're only going to see the... <laughs> no, this is really fast. Um, my name is Maria. I'm from Guatemala and I love neurology. So let's start with the case. Uh, the CC is actually an episodic transient loss of consciousness. Episodic transient loss of consciousness. Fantastic. Um, Gabrielle, tell us what uh, comes to mind here when you hear that chief concern. Sorry, my, my internet crashed a little bit. What was the chief complaint again, Maria? No Episodic. problem. Episodic transient loss of consciousness. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, what I first think about an um, episodic transient loss of consciousness, um, that could mean syncope. Um, I will try to verify if this true, true syncope or if the patient actually was conscious, but what the patient is referring to loss of consciousness or the person that uh, say so. Um, also, um, I could think about uh, epilepsy. Some epilepsies um, present as loss of consciousness, especially a complex one. Um, so I will try to ask if there is any automatism in the episode of the loss of consciousness, uh, what if there is any specific trigger for it um, after the loss of consciousness? Uh, how the patient responds? If if the patient is kind of disoriented or that, like it takes time to actually um, come back to their usual uh, level of consciousness? Um, I don't know how to express that. Um, another question that I would be interesting about is. Um, if, if the patient um, just when, when there's the, the loss of consciousness, if the patient also lose um, tone of the body, muscular tone. Um, so yeah, I'm thinking about syncope or seizures. Fantastic. Yeah, I think the first pass, right, when we hear about <clears throat> loss of consciousness um, is, <clears throat> excuse me, is, is this syncope or seizure? Right, um, and that syncope versus seizure is an important um, and challenging distinction, right? Because often the patient has lost consciousness, so they can't tell us very much about it. And many times, the event that causes the loss of consciousness, whether it's syncope or seizure, uh, is unwitnessed. Someone hears a thump, and they go to the other room and find the patient unconscious. Um, or in the hospital, someone says the patient had something, and by the time you get there, it, it's over. So. Um, you made some, um, some helpful um, points here. One about seizure is that, um, so how do you distinguish these, right, based on the history? And it's very difficult because a patient often can't give you much 
history. And unless there's a bystander there now in the cell phone age, some people take, happen to take a video of these things. That's incredibly helpful, but doesn't always happen. And um, so um, what are some suggestive aspects that make you move more towards seizure? You mentioned the state of consciousness after the event, right? So a patient who has syncope usually wakes up right away, right? The whole point of syncope is there's not enough blood flow to the brain, right? So the body falls down so we can get gravity out of the way and get some blood up to the brain. And so presumably the patient, presuming the patient is able to fall down, um, they will have their consciousness restored pretty quickly. Whereas a seizure on the other hand, right? The loss of consciousness, the seizure event might be short, but because the brain uh, electrical activity has been abnormal, there's often a postictal state, right? As with a generalized seizure where the patient uh, takes time to come back to full consciousness. So that's an important um, distinguishing factor. I, I mentioned about syncope having to lie down um, because there are situations where a patient has syncope and can't get horizontal, and then they might actually have a seizure because there is prolonged uh, hypoxia to the brain that syncope wasn't able to do its job and get the patient horizontal. I, um, I think it was a patient one of my residents followed who I saw in resident um, clinic who was having these events at the poker table. He's playing poker with his friends where he wouldn't feel well and he would collapse and he would jerk and he would shake and everyone thought it was seizure. And I thought the events really sounded like syncope and he had a cardiac arrhythmia and he was in his chair at the table. He couldn't, he couldn't get down, right? So he syncopies and was still vertical, right? And kept getting EEGs that were negative. And I kept saying, let's do an EEG of the heart and <laughs> EKG instead, right? So um, that's an important thing that can sort of muddy the waters here. So you mentioned state of consciousness after the event. Um, I see some of these things I think you mentioned, some I think Rafa has interpolated. Um, loss of continence, right? So bowel or bladder incontinence is common during a generalized uh, seizure. Um, not common during syncope, but all none of these things are perfect. So if someone goes to the bathroom at night and gets up quickly and has micturition syncope, um, not micturition syncope, that is when you syncopize after peeing, but they're on their way to go pee and then they syncopize and their bladder was full and they were trying to go to the bathroom, the bladder might empty. So that's not perfect either. Some people say, well, if the patient gets injured, severely injured, that's more common with epilepsy, with epileptic seizure. Sure, but if someone has syncope in the kitchen and on the way down hits their chin on the counter and then their head on the stove, they could get pretty injured also. So none of these things are actually perfect in practice, but taking them all together, sometimes we can get some sense and there are certainly still questions we would ask. So we talked about what happens sort of after the event, a little bit what happens during the event. Anything else, um, Ravi or Gabrielle, that would help you distinguish syncope from seizure on the history? One thing I would like to add is that with seizures, they're usually postictal phase. So, and with the, with the syncope, there's a predromal symptoms. They feel like lightheaded, sweating, palpitations. Uh, there's like a vasovagal predromal symptoms followed by immediate syncope. And after they regain consciousness right away and they're fully aware of, the, of their surroundings, that's with the syncope. However, with the seizures, they bit their tongue, the urinary incontinence, or they may have like a history of seizures that so they usually take some drugs like alcohol, it could be alcohol withdrawal seizures. I mean, it could be first time seizures, but usually there's some uh, history. Uh, they may have like a underlying history of stroke, the risk factors for the seizure disorder. Yeah, very good. So there's what happens after, right? Rapid return to consciousness with syncope. Although even that's not perfect. What if the patient syncopies and hit their head really hard and got a concussion? Then their state of consciousness might be altered also. So these are always the things that are in some table and some textbook, right? but they're all in real life, a little bit difficult. Um, and there's what happens before, right? So the patient before syncope, presuming it's vasovagal, will start to feel lightheaded or rising warmth or um, sweaty or that their vision is closing in, something like this. And there may be nothing before a seizure, although depending on whether the seizure is focal and secondarily generalized, for example, seizures in the temporal lobe, patients often report a rising sensation in the abdomen or they report fear or a very foul smell. Um, so there can be an aura, right, which is already seizure activity, but it hasn't um, yet spread to generalize. Um, 
So there's the before, there's the after. What about during? What about during the event that would be helpful? Yeah, during the event, uh, uh, someone who has a seizure, they will have a tonic clonic activity, like flexion and extension, in the neck and eyes will be rolling and neck will be extended and uh, limbs will be flexed. There's a position of seizure. Uh, on, on the other side, syncope, they just have loss of posture, loss of uh, muscle tone. Yeah, very yes, good. Um, so, uh, sorry? I was thinking of Dr. Ravi that sometimes patients with seizures have what is called automatisms that are like repetitive behaviors, for example, the, the clonic tonic movements or uh, another kind of stereotyped behavior. It could also uh, mean an absent seizure that the patient suddenly out of the blue lost tone, but still is a seizure and not a syncope. So it's actually hard to differentiate. Yeah, that's part of what I wanted to bring out here. The classic aspects and the, the challenges, right? Especially because you are you don't get to see this. Um, usually, even in the hospital, you get paged that there was a seizure. By the time you get there, it's over. And so it's rare that we get to actually see what's going on. Um, so you're right, um, Ravi, in a generalized tonic-clonic seizure, right? There is tonic and clonic movements, usually very rhythmic jerking of the arms and legs. The eyes are open and rolled back. The, 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 the mouth is clenched, which is why the tongue is often bitten on the sides rather than on the tip. Um, that's a generalized tonic-clonic seizure. There's a whole taxonomy of seizure types and there's all sorts of semiology of seizures. I've heard of ictal spitting and post-ictal nose wiping and all kinds of um, things. And oh, <laughs> Maria is reminding us we learned about what it was it called sunflower syndrome of a child, the seizure, they just, they do this in front of the sun or something, <laughs> something I've never, heard. so all kinds of interesting things, but the most common generalized um, tonic clonic, but there are generalized seizures that are not tonic clonic. Gabrielle mentioned absence seizures. These are much more common in childhood. The, those children can become adults and still have absence seizures where the patient is not conscious, but they're awake. They're not aware, they're not alert. And they may have what's called autonom automatisms where there's some lip smacking or maybe some kind of picking at, at the bed sheets or at their their hand their, um, their clothes or something like this. So those are generalized seizures. There's what used to be called partial seizures, complex partial and simple partial. And then the epileptologists renamed everything a few years ago. So simple partial and they are now called focal seizures with preserved consciousness and complex partial now called focal seizures with impaired consciousness. Um, and the other challenge, and so those patients with focal seizures, if you have, for example, left hemispheric brain tumor near the motor cortex, then the patient could have right-sided focal motor seizures and they're perfectly awake. But sometimes focal seizures can cross the midline and generalize and it starts focal, but becomes generalized tonic-clonic. And then there's the very challenging non-convulsive um, seizures where the patients have electrical activity disrupting consciousness, sort of like the absent state, and they can just be confused or comatose. There's nothing focal, there's nothing on the scan, and they're just in non-convulsive status epilepticus. Um, so we're getting away from episodic transient loss of consciousness, but the other important thing for syncope is that patients can um, collapse, and because the brain is briefly hypoperfused, they can posture, they can twitch, um, and there's classic videos that one of my professors who probably have seen um, on Twitter, uh, Tracy Milligan, who was my program director, yeah. has shown, oops, has shown um, there's these videos of German medical students, I think they're in Germany, making themselves syncopies, and it's very hard to tell whether it's syncope or a seizure when you see what happens. And I've seen in conferences, the neurologist giving the lecture shows a video and says, what do you think? Was it syncope or a seizure? And it's, it can be very hard uh, to tell what's going on. And then um, well, let me ask you one more question, then we'll, we'll unpack that. So I think we've, we've um, squeezed the rag drive, things about syncope and seizure and all the complexities. Anything else that should be on our differential for episodic transient loss of consciousness? Yeah, I would like to add uh, a hypoglycemia. If the patient has a history of diabetes, was taking insulin, the intermittent hypoglycemia can cause uh, loss of consciousness. In addition, I would like to add narcolepsy. Narcolepsy, like sleeping disorders? Yep. 
So presumably narcolepsy, the patient still conscious um, and episodic hypoglycemia would have to be pretty severe for the patient to lose consciousness, but getting into the broader category of episodic neurologic events, right? There's a CPC, I forget how many years ago, New England Journal CPC of episodic confusion that really sounds like seizures and the patient has an insulinoma. And these are just episodic hypoglycemic episodes. Narcolepsy, again, um, more of a sleep disorder, probably the patient is not confused, but sort of falling asleep and maybe a bystander thinks they, they had lost uh, consciousness. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good differential. In terms of episodic transient neurologic events, some people will add TIA to the differential, it really shouldn't be losing consciousness with a TIA, right? Focal neurologic deficit briefly. So if a big clot went up the basilar briefly and somehow found its way out, um, the patient could lose consciousness at presentation of a basilar thrombosis, but a TIA that looked like that, um, hard to imagine. Um, in that family though, of cerebrovascular disease, um, subclavian steel syndrome, again, patients probably dizzy from vertebral basilar insufficiency and with arm exercise in those cases, um, probably not losing consciousness because we do, there's a lot of vessels going to the brainstem, right? To try to make sure it doesn't get hypoperfused even if one is occluded. So I wouldn't really put TIA on transient loss of consciousness per se, although some people um, consider it since it's you know, episodic and neurologic. So we're really probably in the seizure versus syncope and the idea that this is episodic suggests that it's happened um, more than once by the time the patient's presented. So um, great discussion, Gabrielle and, and Ravi. And again, for, for early learners, there are some key features on the history that should help distinguish seizure from syncope. They're still important, <laughs> still important to ask about, but for um, learners at the stage of medical education, realizing that all of the classic teachings have thousands of exceptions, all of these can be a little bit um, tricky in practice. And some patients may get evaluated for both, for the potential causes of syncope and the potential causes of seizure, if we're not sure. And, and still won't tell us what the event is, but we might find some pathology that might explain something. Okay, Maria, tell us more than five words and let's see what we can come up with. Awesome, I really like this discussion because I love seizures, um, so just let me read it. 70, it says, he, he was a 72 year old man with loss of consciousness for the past year, which has happened several times per month. The events are always preceded by dizziness and almost always occur shortly after eating. They last seconds to minutes with a spontaneous return of consciousness and no confusing confusion, and there are no associated chest pain, palpitations, or shortness of breath. Uh, for the review of systems, sorry, <laughs> he has frequent falls. Uh, he was walking independently one year ago and now requires the use of a walker, and he also reports urinary incontinence, which has been progressive for the last six months. He says he has no dysuria, no pain, and no sensation of full blood. You want me to stop there? or I can give you like past medical history. At your discretion, whether you wanna fill in the bottom left there, if it's not gonna um, have a major surprise for us that will change the discussion. Yeah, uh, he has hyperlipidemia and constipation and he uses aspirin, simvastatin and uh, laxatives. Okay, um, interesting history here, maybe not so much what we expected. So that's always fun. Um, Ravi, what, um, I think you're, you're up this time. So tell me what you are thinking here. And yeah, tell yeah. me what you're thinking. Yeah, what I'm thinking is uh, my thought process, the events are preceded by dizziness, preceded by dizziness that tells me like, okay, this is uh, more like a, syncope episode and almost always occur shortly after eating. That's kind of interesting. Why would it always occur after eating? Uh, as you mentioned, it could be insulinoma, uh, could be one uh, thought uh, I had, and they usually last like seconds to minutes with spontaneous return of consciousness and there's no confusion. So that kind of tells me by history, like um, uh, seizure would be lower on the differential compared to syncope. Uh, yeah, um, there's no associated chest pain, shortness of breath, or palpitation. So we can uh, rule out like cardiac events, like no arrhythmias or PE, or uh, any cardiac arrhythmias like you know, bradycardia, tachyarrhythmias. Uh, and the review systems, he has like frequent falls. 
and your incontinence and loss of consciousness. I'm trying to like put like a Venn diagram all of them together. So uh, my differential diagnosis include like NPH, normal pressure, uh, uh, yeah, NPH, uh, normal, um, normal pressure hydrocephalus. And in addition, uh, frequent falls and urine incontinence that also we think of like a Parkinson's. And uh, yeah, those are my differential diagnoses. We did great thoughts, um, Ravi here. So um, yeah, talking about the loss of consciousness itself, which we spent a lot of time talking about, doesn't really sound like a seizure, right? Seizures provoked by eating. I mean, unless you're eating some chemical um, or drug or something like that, but by normal eating, I can't really think of an association though, find some huge 1000 page book of epilepsy and maybe there's something about that. Preceded by dizziness, does hurt a sound also less like seizure, though the dizziness uh, expert, David Newman Toker, who taught us that, and we've talked about this on the morning report before, right? That asking the patient, is it dizziness or vertigo doesn't help that much. I think it has a case report of a patient with um, epileptic vertigo, just to sort of prove the point that none of these things help in practice. So could be, but I agree with you, probably um, not likely. And then the patient returns to consciousness quickly with no um, post-event state, so nothing that sounds like a post-dictal state. So I agree with you, it's probably not seizure. Is it syncope? I mean, I'm not sure. If you said preceded by dizziness passes out, sure, it sounds pretty syncopal to me. Um, shortly after eating, though, not sure what to do with that. I'm imagining if Robbie or Reza would hear, they would, they would tell us all of the hormonal changes that happen at the moment that the food hits the stomach, and then after, as it moves to the small intestine, and the sort of endocrine milieu of the body at that point. And I um, can't do that, but I had the same thought of you. Does that have something to do with insulinoma? insulinomas? That's about as well as I can do localizing things um, in, in the endocrine axis. So yeah, maybe these are episodic hypoglycemia or maybe some vasovagal, you know, the stomach is full and that triggers some autonomic thing that causes um, uh, syncope, but um, be stretching the limits of my understanding of, of, of abdominal processes here. And then we come to the review of systems and sort of what to do with that. Um, if we put everything else aside and you said, well, there's falls in urinary incontinence in a 72 year old, everyone starts thinking about normal pressure hydrocephalus, right? Now that shouldn't cause um, syncope and shouldn't have anything to do with, with eating, right? The only thing that came to my mind is something we didn't mention on our list of episodic transient loss of consciousness, which I've never seen, but which is um, in the textbooks, is that if you have a lesion of the third ventricle, particularly a colloid cyst is the common one, it can act as a sort of ball valve that in certain positions, it can transiently obstruct the ventricles and give hydrocephalus transiently, and the patient can collapse from sort of episodic hydrocephalus. I've never seen that occur in practice, but it's, it's in textbooks. So could this patient have an intraventricular process that's not NPH, but H, right? Just hydrocephalus from some lesion that's expanding in the ventricles, causing the NPH phenotype, which is also the hydrocephalus, part of the chronic hydrocephalus um, phenotype from stretching the frontal lobe fibers involved in maintaining continence and, and um, sort of managing gait. Um, and the process in the ventricles is something that, that has a ball valve effect causing these losses of consciousness. But gee, why would they happen during eating, um, unless it's a really big meal and there's a Valsalva, I'm, I don't know, I have to really, you know, stretch to, to make that one fit together, but something to, to just throw out there. Cause otherwise I'm with you, Ravi, I don't have a good way of, um, putting these sort of falls and in urinary incontinence feature with the, um, loss of consciousness provoked by eating. Um, any other thoughts, Gabriel, on how some of this could fit together? Yeah, I was uh, I I find quite interesting the fact of the frequent falls. So I will inquire more about it. Uh, I will evaluate how the patient walks. If it's a wide way skate, I will be interested in thinking about if this could be a normal pressure hydrocephalus because also it will present a, a it will explain also the urinary, urinary incontinence. But also, a, this is an older patient, so the urinary incontinence can be explained by, for example, a hypertrophy of the, of, the, of the prostata. So 
um, that could be um, not linked to the neuro symptoms, but very interesting to find a unifying diagnosis. Uh, I, I, I don't know if that normal pressure hydrocephalus can present as episodic loss of consciousness, um, but yeah, um, the frequent falls uh, are interesting to yeah. uh, investigate more about. Yeah, perfect transition to the exam, right? For these losses of consciousness, if that was all we had, probably expect a pretty normal exam here. Um, maybe we want to check orthostatic vital signs. If we were really old fashioned, we'd say, why don't you go order lunch and come back to the clinic and I want to watch you eat and see what happens and take the blood sugar and the blood pressure and all that and um, be very uh, scientific at the bedside in the, in the old fashioned tradition. But once we hear this falls, then we have at least something to look for on the exam, right? Because if there's a gait problem that has a broad differential diagnosis and it wasn't last week, maybe two weeks ago, um, Lauren, who I think is here today was discussing, gave us a, a phenomenal um, sort of overview of what to think about with gait, that it could be a motor problem, weakness, right? It could be a sensory problem with proprioception. It could be ataxia from the cerebellum. It could be Parkinsonism from the uh, 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 nigrostriatal pathways. It could be a higher level gait disorder. Parkinsonism, I guess, would qualify also, but a frontal gait disorder. Um, and that gait is sort of the, the symphony of all of the aspects of the neurologic exam, right? So if the patient has normal strength and normal proprioception and no Romberg and no ataxia, right? And then you wanna see the patient walk, right? And what does the walking look like? Um, because if you didn't find a foot drop or you didn't find proximal weakness from myopathy, you didn't find distal symmetric sensory loss for a neuropathy, you didn't find heel shin problems for ataxia, then it's some higher level gait disorder that you're gonna to wanna to watch, right? Does it have that very magnetic quality of NPH? What does that magnetic mean? That sort of as soon as the foot comes up, it, it sort of comes back down to the earth like a magnet because the patient's unsure of their gait. That gait, magnetic gait can also be seen with severe sensory loss because again, once the foot's in the air, there's nothing to tell it where it is because there's no proprioception, it slams um, back down. Is it a Parkinsonian gait sort of stooped, stiff? minimal arm swing, many steps to turn. Um, is, it, uh, is it difficult to characterize gait, which we often see in older patients. We say to our primary care colleagues, this looks like a multifactorial gait disorder. And that's like saying it's a toxic metabolic encephalopathy. People say neurology, you're not helpful. You didn't help us at all. We knew this patient had renal failure and hepatic failure and everything failure. And you told us that's why they're confused. This wasn't helpful. And we say, well, yeah, sorry, it's, that's all we can do. But many people who are older have a little neuropathy, have a little orthopedic stuff going on, maybe have a little bit of Parkinsonism, not Parkinson's disease, but a little bit of Parkinsonism can happen as people get older. Um, and maybe they have a little bit of frontal gait disorder and none of them significant enough to, to be the prominent where you watch the gait and say, oh, that's, that's Parkinson's. I can see that from the waiting room. But enough little things add up to have the patient falling. Um, so that gives us something to figure out on the exam, right? Is there some pattern um, there? What else could we put together? You mentioned, um, I think Ravi mentioned Parkinson's disease and we're not hearing about tremor. Um, we're not hearing about, um, we're not hearing about rigidity per se, though not, patients won't always describe that or slowing of movements. So some patients present with, without tremor. Um, you can get some dysautonomia in Parkinson's disease, but it's not usually a major feature. And usually early falls are not a major feature of Parkinson's disease. But um, what you helped me to think about was the Parkinson's plus syndrome, sometimes called the atypical Parkinson's syndromes, which are another group of diseases. I call them the, the cousins of Parkinson's disease when explaining it to patients. They're in the family of Parkinson's disease, but they're distinct. So um, how are we doing with time? Um, let's see. Okay, so um, Ravi or Gabrielle, do you know um, any of these atypical Parkinson's or Parkinson's plus syndromes? And there's maybe one that could help us tie some of these things together. But I hadn't been thinking about this, so I will credit um, Ravi with, with invoking Parkinson's disease. I don't think that's what's at play here, but you helped me think about another possibility here. I don't know, but I'm very happy to learn. Okay. Ravi, do you know any of these? Um, they're rare. Um, 
Yeah, I love to learn. Love to learn. Okay, me too. So um, atypical Parkinson's uh, syndrome. Some people put dementia with Lewy bodies in this category. It's a Parkinson's plus, right? Parkinsonism plus hallucinations, dementia fluctuations. Um, although the prominent feature there is uh, dementia. The other ones are corticobasal syndrome, progressive supranuclear palsy, and multiple systems atrophy. So progressive supranuclear palsy, the characteristic, characteristic findings are falls at presentation and um, a vertical gaze palsy. Um, a lot of people, as they get older, their up gaze is limited. That's not necessarily abnormal, though up gaze is limited in this condition. Down gaze limitation or slowing of vertical saccades compared to horizontal. Asking the patient, look at my finger, look at my nose, look at my finger, look at my nose, real fast, horizontally, and then vertically, it's sort of, it's sort of slow. Um, that's sort of characteristic of PSP. They can have some facial expressions that are very characteristic, looking sort of surprised. It's probably a facial dystonia, a very furrowed brow. Lots of people also just have that expression. That doesn't mean that they have this condition, um, but often, uh, not diagnosed early. People think it could be Parkinson's, but people aren't really sure. But usually patients with Parkinson's are not falling. The falls in PSP tend to be backward. Um, in Parkinson's, the falls tend to be forward because the patient is stooped forward and is trying to, has this festination of sort of these rapid small steps. And with PSP, it's probably a postural issue and they fall backward. So um, frequent falls and vertical gaze palsy. Um, multiple systems atrophy has several subtypes as a Parkinsonian subtype, MSAP, and a cerebellar subtype, MSAC, those describe the sort of extra pyramidal aspects of the condition, um, but um, many have uh, significant autonomic dysfunction. So that's the, what I was thinking about in this case, they often have, I believe, urinary retention rather than incontinence, but don't quote me on that, it may be one or both. They have syncope, they have orthostatic hypotension, they have strider, I don't know why they get, get that, that nocturnal strider in particular. Um, so what if this patient is having frequent falls from Parkinsonism or a cerebellar ataxia? They're of the age group that people would have get an acquired um, neurodegenerative disorder and that the incontinence and the eating related uh, presumed syncopal episodes are um, related to that. So MSA could be on that differential here. And then corticobasal syndrome, is a very asymmetric syndrome. Usually the cortex and basal ganglia are affected on one side and the patient has some type of unilateral movement disorders and they can have parietal signs also. They can have the alien hand where the hand sort of does things on its, on its own that the patient is not controlling. Um, they can have myoclonus on that side. They can have rigidity, um, tremor. So idiopathic Parkinson's disease and cortical basal syndrome are often very asymmetric, unilateral or very asymmetric at presentation. The others are more um, symmetric. So these are pretty uncommon. Um, I think, let's see, I moved to uh, California about two years ago. And I think in my practice, I've seen one cortical basal syndrome and one PSP in the last year. Again, maybe these patients aren't coming during COVID or whatever, but um, not super common, but in a big academic center practice, maybe one or two of an MSA, PSP, cortical basal syndrome um, in a year with a, anyway, or I could be more in a specialized center, but not super frequent. So that's one way we could tie everything together if this patient had multiple systems atrophy. Um, what we would look for on the exam, there might be some Parkinsonism, but not so much that from the waiting room, you said, oh, look, this patient has Parkinson's disease. We may have a little bit of tremor, but not the classic pill rolling, a little bit of rigidity, um, if they have the Parkinsonian subtype, but the autonomic features are, are predominant and are not well accounted for by um, some systemic illness. Um, okay, what was found on exam, Maria? Okay, just give me one second so that I don't lose my poker face. Um, okay, so vitals, US febrile, um, orthostatics are coming. <laughs> So for orthostatic, he had a pressure of 114 over 90 with, and supine with a heart rate of 85. After standing, after one minute, he had a drop in his blood pressure um, to 102 over 61 with a heart rate of 85. And after standing, after three minutes, 
Um, pretty much the same, 105 over 63 with a heart rate of 87. Other than that, uh, systemic um, heat, he seemed no problems in that area, just neuro. Uh, for mental status, uh, he was alert and oriented. He didn't have any hallucinations or delusions. His mini mental test uh, was 21 out of 30, and he had difficulty drawing and word generate and with word generation. Uh, his speech was decreased, um, low but easily understandable. Um, for motor, he had a coarse resting tremor in his hands. Uh, the right was more pronounced than the left, and he had increased muscle tone and cock wheeling rigidity. Uh, for Cranial nerves, everything was fine. Uh, sensory and reflexes, uh, well, sensory was fine for his posture. He was unable to stand on his feet and uh, they couldn't perform Romberg because of this. And uh, his gait was very slow, shuffling, white based gait. And for cerebellar, he had dysmetria and the Seattle positive. Uh, did you miss the reflexes or did I miss not available or did I miss those? Not available. <gasps> not available. <laughs> yeah. No. No. Okay. Well, I have uh, like all white blood cell differential and everything. So <laughs> yeah, no, I'd rather have the reflexes than the white cell differential, but I know you're, you found this case um, online. So I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not um, giving you a hard time. Just, we always like the reflexes. Okay. Um, We've sort of just been going back and forth. So I think um, Gabriel or Ravi, um, feel free to tackle one or more parts of this exam. Yeah, parts of exam, uh, coarse resting tremor in the hands, which is consistent and increased muscle tone and cogwheel that is consistent with the Parkinson's that we've been discussing about. Parkinsonism, yeah. Uh -huh. Parkinsonism. Okay. Um, in addition, uh, uh, his speech is decreased and slow. Um, there's also, with the, I, I feel like this is all Parkinson, Parkinsonism. Yeah, so there's a lot of features of Parkinsonism here, and I'm glad that you said it that way, right? Parkinson's disease, probably one of the most common causes of Parkinsonism, but there's a broader umbrella of Parkinsonism Meaning these features of rigidity, resting tremor, um, the Parkinsonian gait, bradykinesia, sort of slowing and sort of uh, movements becoming smaller, hypophonia. That picture has a differential of Parkinsonism, right? So there is drug-induced Parkinsonism from dopamine blockers, antipsychotics, metoclopramide, et cetera. And then there is neurodegenerative conditions that cause Parkinson's of which idiopathic Parkinson's disease is the most common, but then there's the Parkinson's plus um, syndromes as well. So there's Parkinsonism here um, and Parkinson's disease certainly in the differential and probably a patient Parkinson's is just so common, probably idiopathic Parkinson's disease with more dysautonomia than usual is probably still more common than um, MSA. But for presentation to have, you know, this degree of autonomic dysfunction and there's some other stuff here that you probably couldn't explain by Parkinson's suggests that's maybe a little bit um, less likely, but I agree most of the stuff that is being highlighted in red here by Maria and Raphael um, has uh, Parkinsonism, it, uh, can be put together into a package that we would call Parkinsonism. Um, any other features, Gabrielle, outside the Parkinsonism here that you saw that need some explanation? Yeah, for example, what, what I found out um, um, that points to Parkinsonism is the um what what Ravi uh, was talking about uh, the resting tremor the uh, the coke wheel rigidity that can help us to differentiate for a first neuron problem rigidity but there are, there is also cerebral problems such as a water based case the unstable and the impossibility of evaluate the Romberg the Romberg test um, also, um, into that, uh, we have a cerebellar problem plus Parkinsonism uh, symptoms plus uh, autonomic dysfunction. So it is very compatible with, with what we're talking about, uh, multi-system multi atrophy. But I'm having a hard time to differentiate between the Parkinsonism and the cerebellar type 
because I see signs of both. Yeah. I, I, I would wanna maybe to ask uh, how the eyes, uh, how was the evaluation of the eyes? Because sometimes uh, when there is cerebellar problem, uh, you can see nystagmus also. Yeah, great question. Was there any nystagmus noted here, Maria, or no comment either way? Yeah, Pro probably there, there might've been. <laughs> There could have been, or, or, or maybe not, depends what part of the cerebellum is affected. Um, so um, I agree with you, Gabrielle. Um, you both pointed out a lot of the features of Parkinsonism, a resting tremor, uh, increased muscle tone that sounds like rigidity due to the cogwheeling rather than spasticity. And rigidity is usually the muscle tone alteration is consistent throughout um, the range of movement and with any sort of velocity of movement, whereas spasticity, um, usually a sort of velocity dependent, meaning if you quickly move the spastic limb in the uh, direction of uh, spasticity in the direction of or in the opposite direction of, if you quickly move the spastic limb, I have to think about that one, um, then it will sort of catch. Whereas if you move it slowly, you can kind of overcome that and rigidity is just sort of continuous increase in muscle tone. Um, so there's a package of Parkinsonism here, but there's other stuff. Too. There are cerebellar findings, right? There's dysmetria and dysdiadocokinesia, the inability to perform rapid alternating movements, one of everyone's favorite words in medicine, right? One of the longest um, physical exam finding names, dysdiadocokinesia. Um, so that can't be explained by Parkinsonism. So we have Parkinsonism and we have cerebellar findings. Then we have a Romberg sign. Many of you have heard my soapbox about the Romberg sign, right? For some reason, um, uh, people learn that that's a cerebellar finding, but the Romberg sign is a proprioceptive finding, right? If a patient has cerebellar ataxia and a wide base gait, probably they're not even gonna be able to get their feet together and stand in perfect balance with the eyes open, right? Let alone closing the eyes. So to have a Romberg sign, the patient has to be able to get the feet together and be balanced with their eyes open. And the, the test you're doing is saying, well, here you are with vision and impaired proprioception, you seem to be doing okay let's remove the vision and see how good your proprioception is. You can sort of get a sense of this in yourself if you like to do yoga and do one of those balance poses on one leg and then close your eyes. It's really hard, right? You're relying on proprioception in a situation that challenges you with normal uh, proprioception, right? So um, it gives you a sense of what the Romberg is testing um, for, for patients with sensory disturbance. So did this patient really have a Romberg and sensory dysfunction? Um, or was this just the patient had cerebellar ataxia and couldn't get the feet together? Now, severe sensory ataxia also you won't be able to get the feet together with the eyes open. But um, again, other things would tell us, is there absent proprioception? What about those reflexes? Um, but we don't have that um, information in, in this case. So we can't say for sure what's going on there, but at the very least, we have Parkinsonism, we have cerebellar findings, and we have orthostasis. And I'm glad that this is reported with the detail of the time um, to stand in. Because some people do orthostatics, the patient lies down, they take the blood pressure, sit up, take the blood pressure, stand up. You have to wait a little bit, um, right? I, I forget what the recommendations are, but um, at least I think a minute or so in the different positions. And there's that 30, 20, 10 rule, right? With heart rate goes up by 30, um, systolic drops by 20 or diastolic drops by 10. We had um, two out of three of those there. I'm not sure what to make of the fact that the BP is dropping and the heart rate is not increasing. Sometimes that happens in patients on beta blockers and have chronotropic incompetence, it's called that the, the normal heart rate that should go up when you exercise or stand up is not going up because the patient's beta block, but this patient's not on a beta blocker. And if there's one area of neurology I am super weak in, it's autonomic neurology. Oh my goodness. I say, oh, it's orthostatic. It's some autonomic thing, but then ask me to interpret tilt table findings or all that stuff. <laughs> Forget it. So if there's someone who loves autonomic neurology or an internist here who can tell us what they think about the static heart rate with significant drops in systolic and diastolic blood pressure. I'm, I'm all ears. For some reason, I um, have, have, have never quite um, made the time necessary to master autonomic neurology because usually we're saying, oh, there's an autonomic piece to this. It's either peripheral or it's central and then we can get back to the stuff we, we know. And the patient has a diminished mini mental score here, right? So there's some cognitive changes. 21 is not normal. People say, well, an older patient, um, not that old, right? And no, medically not that old, right? Just some hyperlipidemia, so pretty healthy. And 21 is pretty low, right? So um, 
I think we have a package here sort of um, uh, that's pushing us towards um, Parkinsonism with cerebellar findings and severe um, autonomic dysfunction. And probably someone can even explain that eating induced uh, syncope, um, I think pushing us towards multiple systems atrophy. Now you ask Gabrielle, is this the cerebellar type or the Parkinsonian type? Um, uh, I presume there can be some, some overlap. And there's a, a classic neuroimaging finding in these patients. Does anyone know what that is? Um, recent step takers or step studiers. I'm not sure if this was on the step or this is a neurology boards thing. Maria is shaking her head. <laughs> if Maria says no, it was not. It was not um, step studying. Called the hot cross bun sign. If you've ever seen this pastry that has a circle and a cross, I think it's a cinnamon pastry called a hot cross bun. I don't know if there's cinnamon actually, but it's a sweet, sweet pastry. It's a circle with a plus sign on it, basically. Something about the way the fibers degenerate in the ponds, it can look like this hot cross bun sign where the ponds has um, looks like, but has a plus uh, plus sign taking up the whole thing. So something we could look for on neuroimaging and degeneration of the cerebellum we would probably see in this case. Could this patient just have idiopathic Parkinson's disease with severe autonomia and we're sort of just Bayesian and say that's more common probably than MSA? Um, I don't know, the dysautonomia is the main um, feature here and the Parkinsonism was sort of something we found and that to me pushes in more towards um, MSA, but I don't think any labs would help us. Though I'm sure they were obtained and you can tell us about them. The patient has very abnormal um, neurologic presentation, probably got neuroimaging, but this is really a clinical um, diagnosis. And um, so it's not a biomarker for this. MSA is a synucleinopathy. The neurodegenerative disorders are increasingly being classified by their, not just what they look like on neuropathology, Lewy bodies or, you know, um, plaques, tangles, but what the abnormal protein accumulation is. Whether that's going to help us figure out how to treat these diseases remains unclear. But for example, um, um, Parkinson's disease and accumulation of alpha synuclein, right? And MSA is also an accumulation of alpha synuclein. PSP is accumulation of tau. Um, I believe cortical basal syndrome is most commonly tau, though there can be Alzheimer's pathology um, as well. Cortical basal, anyway, I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole because we don't have that much time left, but pathological clinical correlations are complicated. So, uh, do we have another aliquot, Maria, or is the next aliquot the diagnosis? We have an aliquot with like labs, imaging, and some story, and then that's it. Okay, let's hear it. So, yes, you're right. We They did labs, and they were all normal. So, CBC, BMP, uh, HbA1c, vitamin B12, folate, RPR, HIV, and EKG, all negative. And I'm going to share my screen just so that you can look at the imaging and maybe like describe it real fast. Give me one second. That's the imaging. Is that it? Yeah, so normal. <laughs> oh, okay. No other frames to show us? <laughs> We don't have the brainstem? No, we only have the one. Okay, so but there is no hydrocephalus, no lesions, yeah, okay. All and right. To finish, we do have some, okay, no, go ahead, and then I'll, I'll finish. What is it? No, go ahead, like the last piece of information is gonna give away the diagnosis. I'm gonna give away the diagnosis, okay. so. Gabrielle, Ruby, what, um, we have normal labs, normal imaging. Does that mean the patient's normal? Normal brain MRI, right? Nothing, anything going on here? So for, for what I think in the, the normal labs points toward uh, and supports the, our hypothesis of thinking of multisystem atrophy. Um, for what I understand about this disease, the, the diagnosis is kind of, hard to establish because the gold standard is made with biopsy, but we don't want to biopsy our, this patient. <laughs> um, um, another a, that we can use is level DOPA because in Parkinson we can expect a, um, a relief for the symptoms with level DOPA. 
in comparison with multisystem atrophy, but I think the final diagnosis would be multisystem atrophy for me. Okay, yeah, very good. Yeah, so not all diseases have a clear imaging a biomarker. I would have liked to have seen the brainstem in that case and in this case and see if it has this classic um, finding, but um, right, the MRI being normal doesn't mean the patient doesn't have a, a brain disease for sure. You mentioned levodopa, right? Parkinson's part of the diagnostic criteria. You can get a, a dopamine transporter scan, and but these are expensive and are often here not covered by insurance. And you can make a pretty good clinical diagnosis of Parkinson's disease without a fancy um, test. Um, but part of the diagnostic criteria, at least the last time I read them, was that the patient responds to levodopa for Parkinson's disease because if they have Parkinson's disease, their symptoms um, should get better with levodopa. Unfortunately, that's not typically the case with the Parkinson's plus syndromes. Um, they can respond a little bit to levodopa, um, but they may not, or the response may be transient. Um, and what would we be treating here? The Parkinsonism may respond a little bit if the rigidity is bothersome to the patient. And in these patients, I usually try it, um, but wouldn't really be expected to benefit the dysautonomia. Um, and often just has uh, sadly no effect in, in the patients with Parkinson's plus. But you're right for Parkinson's, idiopathic Parkinson's disease, the response to levodopa is part of the, you know, treatment, treatment gives diagnosis, right? And sometimes the patients presenting at an advanced stage of that disease, it can be pretty miraculous actually that they're um, barely able to move. And after a few days of levodopa, they're getting up to walk. That probably wouldn't, wouldn't help in this case. So Gabrielle's um, saying MSA, Ravi, what are you thinking here? Yes, I'm thinking of uh, Parkinsonism. Parkinson. Those are, those are my thoughts. Yeah, Parkinsonism. Yeah, so could it still be Parkinson's disease? Just this patient has more dysautonomia than average. That's, I think, fair game also. Maybe the normal imaging, if we say the brainstem looked normal too, we say, and I'm not sure how sensitive that sign is for MSA, maybe this could be idiopathic uh, Parkinson's disease with particularly severe dysautonomia. Um, how would we figure that out? Probably we would give this patient levodopa and if it helps, that's great. It still wouldn't necessarily give us a diagnosis, but help the patient a little bit. And we think about midodrine and fluoronef and those things for compression stockings, other things for uh, the orthostasis. This dopamine transporter scan, I should mention just since I mentioned it, um, will show a deficit in, I don't know exactly what they're looking at, but a deficit in signal in the basal ganglia, dopamine transport, <laughs> presumably, but I'm not sure if it's exactly what the, what is generating the signal, but um, it can tell you there is a degenerative Parkinsonian disorder. It does not distinguish between Parkinson's disease and Parkinson's plus. So an abnormal DAT, we call them DAT scans, dopamine transporter scans, abnormal DAT would tell you, oh, this patient has a neurodegenerative Parkinsonian disorder, but it could be MSA, it could be PSP, it could be Parkinson's disease. So we, the only times that's really a helpful test is if there's some patients who've been on antipsychotic medications for a long time, develop Parkinsonism, they're at the age where they could have idiopathic Parkinson's disease. And the question is, is this the drugs? Did the patient, was the patient gonna get Parkinson's disease anyway and the drugs unmask them? Or does this patient have idiopathic Parkinson's disease because the patient may need to be on antipsychotic medications um, to uh, maintain their mental health and people are obviously reluctant to start changing them around. So sometimes in those cases, if you're really on the fence, you can consider a dopamine transport scan because I believe, um, again, don't quote me on this, but I believe it will be normal in the drug-induced cases. So you could sort of see, is there a neurodegenerative piece of this? And then that might help guide the medication titration, but Often that's also just something we, we, we do clinically. Okay, so I'm not sure what piece of information left is gonna give us the diagnosis unless sadly this patient passed away and got an autopsy, um, uh, but uh, presumably it was a clinical diagnosis. So Maria's uh, poker face phase of, of Maria's presentation is over. <laughs> yeah, <tell her. laughs> yeah, that was so hard, uh, but yes. All of the information left is clinical. So they did uh, the postprandial uh, testing and he had postprandial hypotension and orthostasis and they did treat uh, his Parkinsonism with levodopa but as you mentioned uh, it only responded partially and briefly 
So, um, yeah, winner, winner, chicken dinner. It's multiple system atrophy. Or I saw in the in the chat somebody mentioned the the eponym, shy dragger syndrome. So, kudos to everyone. Very nicely done. Great um, teamwork here because we were really on that loss of consciousness and seizures, and it was hard to pull away from that. At least for me into the neurodegenerative space. We heard falls and continents. They said, oh, is there NPH or some ventricular thing here? But it was really Ravi who said, oh, does this patient have Parkinson's disease? That reminded us we're not in the, the how, how strongly we can get anchored by the chief concern, right? That we were thinking of transient loss of consciousness. We spent a half hour talking about seizure versus syncope and to pull our brains from that space into, well, it sounds not like seizure. So it's something syncopal and this stuff is just sort of in the review of systems, right? At least for me, it was a little hard to, to frame shift there into the neurodegenerative space. But once Ravi said Parkinsonism, you know, you start um, rearranging, rearranging your cards on the table and, and seeing what connects to each other. And that helped us see, oh, there's something that sounds neurodegenerative plus uh, dysautonomia. And that's a picture you can see in MSA. Um, so Shy Drager, I think, um, is the name for the pure dysautonomia version of this, but I could be wrong. I think originally they call it MSAP, MSAC, and MSAA, which is just pure autonomic failure. I think that one is the Shy Drager one, but I could be wrong. Fortunately, now these eponyms are going away. We just all due respect to Shy and Drager or Shy Drager. If it's one person, just call it multiple systems after. So this is pretty uncommon, but when you see a patient that looks kind of like Parkinson's disease, but has some things that don't fit, um, they don't respond to levodopa, this sort of Parkinson's plus, something that can be on your differential. And this one, the main feature is dysautonomia. Great, well, thank you for finding this case, Maria. Excellent discussion, Ravi and um, Gabrielle, and great teamwork to come up with this diagnosis before we even got um, to the exam. And, Will I be here next week? Yes, next week. So it would be great if um, Maria always <laughs> seems to be able to find uh, a case or bring one. But if someone has a neurology case they'd like to present, it doesn't have to be a rare, um, difficult diagnosis like this one. It can be a common um, diagnosis or it can be a common uh, chief concern with a rare diagnosis or a rare chief concern with a common diagnosis. We've had all varieties. So don't think it has to be a case reportable mitochondrial gene problem sort of thing. It can be a stroke and, um, and that's totally fine. And I uh, think if you might like to discuss, look how much fun we had and we all learned together and you heard both Ravi and Gabrielle say, I don't know the answer to that question, but I wanna learn. And that's why we're here, right? So it's a low pressure, fun environment to learn some neurology. Fantastic. I haven't been following the chat. Any questions, concerns? Did the MRI have contrast? It did not. And um, I think that would particularly help us for neurodegenerative, but to make sure there's no meningeal or enhancing um, lesions is a good is a good point. Um, all right, anything else? Questions, comments, concerns? Okay, have a wonderful. What Maria is saying something with the yeah, your teaching view. points for Rafa. <laughs> oh, sorry, teaching points. I'm still um, oh, in the cognitive just... about that. Even Rafa for. <laughs> No, 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 it's, it, it, it's just maybe you're in a hurry, so that's super okay if you're... No, go ahead. If you don't have the time. Okay, so um, just let me... So we, I had this patient with a bizarre transit loss of consciousness, and then we started with um, uh, with the single definition, which is decreased perfusion to the brain, most due to a uh, drop in the blood pressure. And it's usually visovagal syncope with prodromal symptoms. So history here is very important. So the patients will see tell you that they had diaphoresis, visual tunneling. Also make sure to rule out malignant cause like arrhythmia in the study, for example, of ventricular tachyarrhythmia. So usually these patients with cardi cardiac arrhythmias, they uh, wake up really well. They don't have those drum symptoms. So uh, history here is key. And we talk about a seizure as a, uh, another cause of episodic tension loss of consciousness. And there are some clues in the history that can lead just 
to think about seizure, for example, side long tongue lacerations, post episode, loss of sphincter with bowel and bladder incontinence, also tonic and clonic mo movements. Other causes that we thought about were, uh, for example, hypoglycemia, traumatic bitter injury, intoxications, metabolic disturbances, conversion disorders, narcolepsy, and structural cardiac causes like aortic stenosis. And then we saw that this patient had frequent falls and urinary incontinence and loss of consciousness after eating. And there was this spell that was shared by Fatma on the chat about swallow deglutition syncope, which is something that I've never heard before. It's a neurally mediated situational syncope that swallowing results in excessive basal vagal stimulation that results in cardiac inhibition and buried arrhythmias. Uh, when we tried to combine the frequent falls and they were in iron incontinence, we thought about Parkinson plus syndromes like Lewy body syndrome, MSA, or another frontal gait disorder. On a physical exam, we saw orthostatic hypertension and decreased in slow speech, cerebral focal findings, and we discussed a little bit about orthostatic hypertension, which is dark and blood pressure on standing from the supine position. And many causes could be leading to orthostatic hypertension. For example, vasodilators, volume depletion, the side of adrenal insufficiency, or sympathetic blockade. Uh, but then we saw that this patient, we thought about Parkinson's disease or Parkinson's, but the patient also had cerebral focal findings, which are kind of unusual. And then um, Robert reminded us that actual level double can be used as a tool for diagnosis because this patient can be much better. And then um, there's this pearl that I really love from Aaron that sometimes we tend to associate the Roman syndrome to the cerebellum, but actually Roman syndrome is a test of proprioception that it used to distinguish sensory from cerebral ataxia. And if positive, we have a sensory ataxia. There's a defect in the posterior column or a neuropathy in the setting, for example, of vitamin B12 deficiency. So thank you, everyone. Hope everyone had fun and learned something today. I hope to see everyone tomorrow. Thank you. That was a very uh, wonderful teaching points and super rapidly <laughs> delivered, uh, which was impressive. And we still finished at 10.10 and we started at 9.10. So if you want to start earlier, finish on time please volunteer, start thinking, maybe I'll volunteer next week. Maybe I'd like to volunteer. Look how much fun that was. Um, and if you have a case, but you're not sure if it's you know the right format or whatever, feel free to reach out to our team, Maria, Gabby, Valeria, Team Neuro uh, in uh, CP Solvers would be happy to, um, to take a look and help you get it ready for presentation. All right, everyone. Thank you, Maria, for digging up um, this case. Rafa, for your teaching points. Gabrielle and Ruby for the great discussion and teamwork that um, moved us away from is this seizure or syncope and is there an insulinoma to, hey, there's something with a neurodegenerative feel going on here. All right. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you.